afternoon. Uh, I'm Peter Tortorelli from Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and I'm here to describe uh, progress over the last few years on an uh, ORNL effort to model scale exfoli exfoliation in, in steam boilers. This uh, work uh, had its origins or its motivation from the 2003 MPL EPRI workshop held here. Uh, since then, a uh, project was started at a modest level. Uh, that has um, gone from there to try to start uh, quantifying uh, some of these effects, even where the data may not be pristine or where uh, mechanistic uh, models are, are not fully developed, yet we're putting the framework together so as the data gets better and as the mechanisms are better known, we, uh, we can do a better job at prediction. <clears throat> I should acknowledge Adrian Sabo and Ian Wright. They did the real heavy lifting and most of the detailed work in, in this model. And, uh, and done a, a great job in my opinion. Okay, the goal of this project uh, is to uh, provide a tool for managing or, co or even controlling scale uh, exfoliation. The approach used is to develop a mathematical model uh, capable of predicting when exfoli exfoliation is likely to occur as a function of all the things you've heard about today. Alloy type, location in the steam circuit, boiler operating, deposit conditions, etc. It's to incorporate the then uh, this ability to estimate uh, extent of tube blockage as a function of time. We then test the model using actual boiler experience and data from, from boilers. We try to use it, and I'll show you some preliminary examples, in a predictive mode to guide boiler experiments and eventually to manage or control exfoliation. Finally, the model is being constructed with, uh, to be flexible. So as data and as mechanisms are, are forthcoming, we can plug them into these modules and, and improve the model, not have to go back and, s and start from scratch. So the, the one of the, uh, an important part of the approach is to include this flexibility to incorporate this new knowledge, field data, and modeling aspects as, as they become uh, more perfected and, of course, are validated. Uh, so in this presentation, very, very briefly, not going to go into any details, is to describe this model, uh, its basis and its structure. And when I say model, uh, 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 in, in this case, I'm referring to the overarching model, which is, cons which is built of many different building blocks. And so when we call it an integrated model, it means it integrates many other building blocks that go into, into the main model. So sometimes we'll be talking about models that go into these building blocks. Sometimes we'll call them modules or sub-models, and they all contribute to the predictive ability, which is ultimately to get to this blockage model that I just mentioned. The other part of the presentation um, is to highlight needs that have come out of this effort. Uh, you, you've heard many of them already today. Now taking it from the opposite view, from um, people charged with trying to model it, it's very easy to see where the holes are in our understanding and in our data. You've heard a lot about that already today, but we'll just reinforce that from the modeling end. And so we'll take you through the same kind of things that Tony was talking about, but now from a modeling perspective, in terms of tracking temperature, uh, putting in the right uh, scale thickening kinetics, looking at scale morphologies and failure events to define the mechanisms for failure, and calculating strain uh, strains and how they develop as a function of time and around the circuit. <clears throat> putting all that together, we ultimately aim to have this blockage model, a quantitative blockage model by which we can predict the amount of scale loss or, uh, and, uh, and how it deposits it where in, and where in the circuit. So uh, the model takes as its basis this scenario for scale exfoliation. This is nothing new to anyone in this room. The oxide growth rate depends on temperature, time, and alloy. The evolution of the strains in the scale are from several sources, including oxide growth, uh, as well as CTE differences, although as you know, see the CTE uh, differences usually are the uh, major contributor to the, to the, to the strain development and, and even relaxation by, by creep. Uh, includes scale failure at some critical strain, and the mode of exfoliation depends on, on the alloy. As has already been said today, and we're saying it from the modeling point, viewpoint too, we need details of the compositions and the properties of the actual scales formed to, to uh, obviously make this an accurate model. Again, we're showing the old data here for FE304. We're 
taking uh, the same approach first uh, postulated or first put forward by, uh, by the, this infamous or famous report uh, uh, from 1978, which pioneered really the approach for using uh, strain-based exfoliation criteria, and in particular for compression, compression failures for using a strain energy uh, criteria for predicting uh, exfoliation. You'll see uh, we, we've modified the, the original Armored diagram or, or schematically uh, depicting it here, where if you stay um, in the region of elastic strain as shown by these dashed lines here, you're in a, a safe condition. But as soon as you exceed these criteria, whether it's intention or compression, you start going into scale failure modes and ultimately into, into exfoliation. And some of these failure modes are the ones that uh, Michael Schutzer has recently elaborated on in, in, his, uh, in his work on, on scale failure and, and, and effect of defects. <coughs> we are using a concept of strain trajectory. Um, and what simply we mean by that is we look, we, we calculate strain as a function of time as the oxide grows, and we map that onto a, uh, uh, this type of modified AMET diagram to track the time or the oxide thickness to where we, we pass one of these, these failure lines. <coughs> so the current modeling approach, and now you see why I won't go into any details, involves a number of steps and a, low, a number of uh, scale um, uh, modules, uh, but it addresses uh, exfoliation in, in this sequential way. We start with oxidation kinetics as influenced by temperature, alloy parameters, the tube configuration we take into account that we're, we have tubes, and uh, the boiler operation. We move on to scale morphologies, which are obviously linked, uh, to look at them again, the evolution with, uh, with time and temperature, using a lot of the imperial knowledge that people like Barry and others have, are, are quantifying. Uh, we try to quantify defects, uh, identify the mole of failure for the different um, alloys and conditions, and try to track shape si and size of exfoliated flakes. Much harder said than, than done. You have to make some big assumptions there. Then we move on to the strain generation. Uh, we have to know what the physical cons constraints. Again, the ge geometry comes into play here and, taken, and is taken into account in the model. Uh, the temperature <coughs> evolution, the properties of the oxides and alloys, the temperature and pressure cycling, and then again, the criteria for scale failure and separation, which then allows us to map a trajectory and uh, see where it passes the critical thickness for failure. And then finally, and the, and the most difficult part, because it's based on the, the greatest number of assumptions, in my opinion, is the fate of the debris, uh, which gets us to the blockage model. And again, take into account the tube configuration, gradients along the tube, the amount of oxide ground, and the amount of oxide lost. And then look at blockage as a function of the footprint of this deposit. <coughs> Okay, <laughs> this is overwhelming, but at least you have a copy of this in your, in your um, uh, package. I'm not going to go through all these steps, obviously, if we want to get out of here by Wednesday or Thursday, Wednesday night. Uh, but each of these specific process, processes are addressed in individual model, modules in this model to allow this flexibility and to add modifications as, uh, as we go. While there's certainly some uncertainty in, in each of these steps, we, from our point of view, the greatest uncertainty and the greatest um, need for better mechanistic understanding relates to the st strain from oxide growth, the criteria ultimately for scale failure and exfoliation, and the two blockage scenarios as a function of time and steam temperature, and I should add here, uh, deposit footprint. <coughs> so uh, the calculations involve a stepwise iterative procedure Track we start with temperature and we track it from there. We look at changes in temperature as a function of time and oxide thickness. We take into account heat fluxes and how temperature profiles change as, as the oxide thickens, and I'll get back to that in a moment. We look at the increase in oxide thickness as a function of time, calculate the strains, and construct these uh, uh, strain trajectories, uh, see when we exceed the criteria for scale failure, and translate that into a criteria for scale loss of it exfoliation, and then take these and go into the sub-modules that address blockage tendencies, where we go from a point-to-point -point type of calculation to a translation to a full length of superheated tube. And again, 
I'll, I'll show an example of that at the end. <clears throat> so what I want to do now that I've outlined the model, I want to give you some needs and, and illustrative examples from what that model is telling us. First and foremost, as you all appreciate, as already been mentioned today, you need an accurate knowledge of temperature for oxide growth. And the complications are the thermal gradient, the heat flux, and the psychic operation. Uh, you all, uh, as you can see, uh, the temperature uh, isn't uniform anywhere across that tube wall or in the, on the firewall side or, or the oxide side or on the steam side. And so we have to track temperatures at, at all these points. An important um, issue that we debate a lot is what are you going to, going to take as the growth temperature? Is it this uh, layer between the two oxides? In reality, in the model, we typically take uh, the tube wall steam side oxide temperature for the inner, inner layer and the, the temperature at the gas oxide interface down here for the growth temperature of the outer layer. Again, we can debate that and that's part of what, what the workshop is about. <coughs> The boiler operating scenarios that the model can take into account and does is uh, involve irregular cycling of steam pressure and, and temperature. An example on the top is a daily cycle with, with, a, with a shutdown, with an outage uh, under supercritical steam conditions. <clears throat> These small changes uh, represent uh, transitions between partial and, and full loading. This is, this is the outage. Another cycle that we've looked at is in, uh, in the supercritical steam side. We look at a weekly cycle. Now, I, I point out that this scale here is much more expanded compared to here. We're just looking at this range. But this is a typical cycle between partial and full, fully loadings that we used in, in the model. Uh, um, as has been pointed out, steam um, temperature and pressure may not, uh, the cycling of those may not coincide. Again, we have to take that into account. Pressure cycling is included in the strain calculations. And the way we uh, sum the oxide growth for any particular time is that we sum it over all times at, uh, during these different uh, temperature events, or different temperatures and different ramp times. And so each of these oxide growth is summed uh, based on these different time ingredients. <coughs> Why didn't do that? It's here. OK, an example of the, the, the how the effect on temperature is uh, where we look at the in increase of the interface temperatures with time and oxide difference for 347H uh, using these initial steam conditions and the initial metal midwall temperature. You can see as the oxide grows, there's a substantial increase at the two combustion gas interface as well as the metal oxide interface uh, holding the steam temperature constant. Uh, this is the type of calculations we have to do to accurately track temperature and therefore convert that to oxide thickness. <coughs> uh, again, uh, I'm stating the obvious to well-informed, but uh, we absolutely have to try to use pedigree oxide growth kinetic data to, to, get, to, get, to do it right. We need oxide thickness measurements. Uh, as you all know, surface data is scarce. Scales and arsenic uh, scales can be very regular. Uh, irregular. Uh, we've talked about this several times today and in the past in the previous workshop. The lab data is typically best based on masking and may lead to confusion and may not translate very well to operating, uh, you know, operating conditions. And therefore, lab data and field data often disagree. <clears throat> I should say that the data, such as the stuff shown here, um, is from, from the field. <coughs> and the data we've used so far, the kinetic data, is field data, verifi verifiable. So obviously, one of the recommendations coming out of the model, again, this would not surprise you, is you need protocols for making scale thickness measurements and need guidelines for reconciling this field data with the lab measurements. As Paul said, have to get the monkeys together. And uh, this, uh, this is another way of saying it. <clears throat> the mode of exfoliation and the type of scale loss often differs among the alloys. Uh, the, the, the exfoliation can involve the loss of scale Deposit formation and two blocking, and that's what we'll be addressing uh, with the blockage mo model. But we, 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 we want to point out that there is also the mechanism where you have scale lifting without loss, and this decreases the heat transfer and leads to tube overheating effects. So we can try to track that with the, with the right kind of mechanisms with this model also. Exfoliation behavior depends on the alloys. You've heard a lot about this already. I, I won't touch on that again. But model can track these if, if we're confident of what's happening. Ongoing efforts uh, are underway to understand the evolution
separation. And, um, I'm not going to repeat what Barry told you, but I put these in here just to reinforce the importance of those type of observations. And not only that, those types of observations that knit together the disparate type of uh, observations you hear coming from different plants. I think it's very important to look for these universal uh, trends if, if the model is going to get, get any more. And so you see the differences between uh, fritics and austenitics, and then between fine grain and, and coarse grain on uh, 347. Uh, Barry's already talked about all these. In fact, these are some of the same <coughs> figures from the same paper. Here's an important, uh, 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 important result coming out of the modeling, and that is all components of the scale must be considered. So if there's hematite in the scale, and it's not just an academic exercise because these calculations have shown <coughs> that hematite increases the compressive strain in typical scales in a significant manner. Uh, the amount and form of distribution of hematite can greatly modify its effect. What these, uh, this computational exercise showed that as you increase the proportion of the hematite in the magnetite, and that, that goes as you go down in this direction, from zero to 100%, you have much greater compressive strength in the, in the, in the oxide on, on, on the ID. Uh, and so this is an important uh, effect that has to take, uh, be taken into account in the strain development. On the right-hand side, we're showing uh, <coughs> what happens uh, depending on how it's distributed the scale. If it's 100% if it's hematite, it has a, 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 the, the minimum uh, oxide thickness for scale affinity is way down here on the, on the order of uh, 20 microns. If it's dispersed throughout uniformly throughout the magnetite, it, it's, it's a bit higher, but still pretty scary. And uh, if it's dispersed in the outer 20% of the magnetite, as mostly we've seen from the scale morphologies, uh, it, it's not nearly as, uh, as effective, but yet still significantly decreases the criteria, the, the minimum thickness for failure. So this is something we, we will have to take into account. That being said, the calculations I'm going to show you for about, about deposits will, will, not, will not include this effect, just make matters worse. <clears throat> uh, the strain calculations were, were done fairly rigorously. It, it included oxide growth strains, even though we don't know that mechanism very well, we, we looked at a, a pitting bed, pitting bed, bedworth, pilling bedworth type of uh, volume uh, expansion to, to account for that. Of course, we factored in the CTE and creep relaxation, as well as the geometry that is that was being done under the constraints of a, of a typically sized tube. What you see here um, for strain as a function of oxide thickness, you have a rapidly developing strain. As, um, as the scale grows uh, initially, uh, as you would think from parabolic kinetics, and you see there's a significant difference in, in strain uh, depending on partial load or, or, or full load. This is doing a normal boiler cycle with no shutdown events. Now, if you put in some shutdown events, you see that you have substantial increases in strain uh, due to the CTE mismatch. And if you look at the strain trajectory, and this is a six month. These are six-month shutdown cycles. You can see that here's the compressive strain in the magnetite at shutdown. If you want to calculate the entire strain, including that in the spinel, it gets down to here. Uh, but the, the important thing is to look at the, uh, the compressive strain in the magnetite, and it is substantial on, on the order of a few percent compressive. These are all uh, calculations that I'm showing you here in the next few slides. Of it. Uh, 347H, the coarse grain, no hematite uh, under these uh, initial conditions uh, for the steam temperature and, and, and mid-wall metal temperature. So if we do a strain trajectory, here's our, our RMET diagram. Uh, where we're applying uh, the, the strain as a function of total oxide thickness. Here's the strain, strain from the shutdown, and you see it passes the delamination line. So this will predict that we are already well past thickness that, that this strain will lead to scale, uh, scale exfoliation. <clears throat> In fact, if you look at it, if you look at, um, if you look at it, you can see that it's about 50 microns. Uh, you would need uh, less than 50 microns of scale uh, to avoid this situation. And we're well past that during, after the first shutdown. <clears throat> point we want to make, too, is that the generation of strain may be sufficient, so you don't need a 
full shutdown cycle to, to exfoliate that scale. And that's shown here, where if we're looking for about um, uh, two, two, uh, uh, two to two and a half percent strain uh, for, to, to exceed that criteria, we are we're getting it at about 250 to 300 degrees Celsius. So you, you may want, from a management or a control point of view, you may may be able to get to, get get to it without going all the way down to room temperature or, or low temperatures. The time and scale failure obviously is calculated from the oxide thickness. So if, if 46 uh, microns is, is the critical one, that um, that translates into a about 800 hours. Boiler operation, uh, depending on, again if it's a super critical or, 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 or hard conditions. Okay, now we move into the blockage, and now we're getting on thinner ice in terms of the assumption we have to make. Uh, it extends the type of uh, strain calculations and, and uh, failure predictions from where, from what you do at one point in the loop in one heat flux uh, you know, and around an entire super. Superheater tube loop, and this takes a lot of attention, a lot of detailed accounting for which Adrian's a whiz. It provides a method for relating the tendency for blockage to plant operating parameters, and we'll show an example of that. And it incorporates new submodules on top of all the ones I, I mentioned earlier. And this includes strain energy at different locations along the tube, exfoliation area as a function of strain energy, the mass of the exfoliated scale, volume of the deposits, and the area blocked includes significant assumptions about the footprint of the deposit. We use an assumption here that a, a typical deposit length is about five times the length the ID of the tube. This is similar to an assumption that was made in the Army report, and for lack of a better approach, we're using that here. However, recent uh, radiographic results that, uh, that John has been uh, monitoring for EPRI show that this may be a pretty decent assumption about the footprint of, of deposit. Of course, there are other assumptions, too, about the exfoliation area as a function of strain energy. There, we're also following uh, Armit's Arm uh, initial strain energy approach, and I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, we start again with the calculation of the metal temperature across the entire super, superheater loop. And in this case, that means coming out of the mixer, following the steam flow, going up to the header here. Uh, the, this. This um, B arrow here indicate, uh, indicates a change in, in, in diameter of the tubing. And that, as you can see, is reflected in the temperature calculations, uh, again, because the geometry of the tube is taken into effect. And you see we contract temperature and therefore oxide growth thickness as, as, as a function of the length along the tube. These calculations involve not only temperature uh, ca uh, calculations, but also heat flux. And we find by working with some boiler operators that our calculations of heat flux and temperature are, are pretty much validated uh, based on their CFD codes and what, and what they do to model their boilers, at least in this one case, in this simplified case. So we're pretty confident in that. And you see as we, we, we translate that, in, we then predict oxide thickness as a function of length along on true blue. We then, of course, apply our strain uh, calculations and apply that to the criteria for exfoliation. Uh, so we, we, we know that, then the, 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 the key question then is, we, we know when we exceed this criteria for failure or exfoliation, but how much scale would exfoliate? Well, that depends on the type of defect that, that's forming the in initiating event. And we have models here, uh, as shown here, some models for, the, for, for those defects that form. And then, of course, if you want to really know how much scale would exfoliate, then you have to get some models of area fraction of oxide spall. Amit puts forth one that where the area fraction is proportional to the elastic strain energy in the scale with only the outer layer uh, exfoliating. There's been a, a modification of this type of, of, of model uh, based on Moon and Lee based on some work going back to Hugh Evans in 1984 where the area fraction is proportional to the fraction of energy stored in the scale volume. For the present case, uh, we're using this type of approach, but the model can easily accommodate this also. And this is, uh, this is the AMID type of approach for scale uh, uh, area 
Jewish Girl Association, uh, exfoliation, they, they published this data as a function of the elastic energy function, which is just Poisson's ratio times uh, the thickness of the uh, oxide scale times the square of the strain. Um, and, and we then extrapolated to, uh, to, to our conditions up here. <coughs> but an important point that I want to uh, make is that Ahmet calculated this for the <coughs> entire scale. And if you calculate what percentage of that is in the magnetite layer, and just look at the magnetite layer, because that's coming off. Uh, and actually, the magnetite layer, if you, re if you normalize this to the energy in the magnetite layer, it actually comes off at lower elastic energy functions, uh, as uh, you may ex expect. But following the Ahmet criteria for, for consistency, uh, we, we, we used that approach where we used the total energy in the scale. But you can do it either way, and you get qualitatively the simil similar results. Uh, and, uh, and quantitatively, if it, it goes in the same, uh, it, it, the maximum is in the same, same position. But if you show this for different outlet steam temperatures, um, and you predict the exfoliated mass of, of, the, of the magnetite as a function of operating time. You see uh, in assuming uh, shutdowns, six month intervals, uh, weekly operating cycles I showed before with supercritical steam, and you get not only scalar exfoliation, but then it regrows, uh, resetting the kinetic equation. You see that after the second shutdown cycle, you, you've maximized the amount of scale so this is just one example. Uh, you can use many others, but this we think is the, the, what we're trying to get at with the model. Is it a predictive capability for predicting when to expect uh, the scale to come off and, and how much? Again, a lot of uncertainties in here in, in, in returns to the with respect to the nature of the flakes that come off and how they deposit. But this is the first step in doing that. And this is the prediction of the mass. Now, if you want to turn that into a prediction into how much of the uh, area is blocked, you have to make other assumptions uh, about the size of the deposit and the density of the deposit. Uh, taking, and we've done it for a number of different parameters in the, of those parameters, but assuming the porosity uh, is about 25% in these deposits, you see how this then tracks the, the mass in the sense that, again, uh, after the second uh, shutdown cycle, you can have up to up to almost 100% of, of the two blocked at, at these higher steam outlet temperatures, even 60% under these conditions. So again, um, the blockage fraction exceeds 50% at the second six-month down cycle, and almost up to uh, far exceeds it at, uh, at these higher temperatures. Uh, this is the type of predictive ability we think is of most value to people who are running boilers in order to try to manage or control their, their exfoliation. Now, the change in steel type, as we all know, can have a large effect on, on, on oxidation growth and on spallation uh, parameters. And it also is reflected in this model in terms of the prediction of the blockage. If we take, for an example, uh, some uh, qualified data on uh, 347H versus 347HFG, coarse versus fine, if, uh, if we take this type of data set and plug it into the model, you can see that uh, it goes from maximum blockage or full blockage almost at, at the second shutdown cycle to, now look, the, the, the scale has changed here again. So, uh, I will call your attention that this is just 20%. You, you don't really start getting um, blockages till the um, fourth cycle, and then, then just about 20%. So controlling uh, oxi oxide growth can have a tremendous effect on when you would, when, when you would predict maximum blockage. Um, on the, uh, the other hand, if, if this was uh, the difference due to shock peening, you could also factor that into the model again through its effect on the scale growth rate. And uh, shock peening could have uh, similar effects on this, uh, this uh, percentage of blockage. So there are, there, there, that's another way to ameliorate the problem. So continuing issues, there are a number of them. With the oxide scale data, uh, still there, there's some disagreement on scale morphologies and the mode of evolution for specific alloys. Uh, quantification of the evolution of flaws, which was touched down, uh, on during various talk, but I think it's a very important part from a modeling point of view. And then not only evolution of flaws, but their effects on the modes of oxide separation and loss. And I'm sure Michael Schutzer would jump up with that. Uh, 
reconciling oxide growth kinetic data from the field and lab measurements. We need protocols for, for how to go about measuring these thicknesses and being consistent uh, and normalizing them to the correct conditions. It's very important. <coughs> And uh, which temperature, as I pointed out, which temperature you use for oxide growth and make sure we get the right temperature and track it accurately. Uh, uh, under strain calculations, we still need a better rationale for incorporating strain from oxide growth, but quite frankly, that's not the major contributor. But there, there may be conditions where this will be important. We need improved criteria for scale fa failure and exfoliation, or even if it's not improved, we need a consensus and about which ones to use, because there are a number of them out there. That's one of the purposes of this workshop, hopefully, get us going in that direction. And then from a plant data point of view, we need better documentation of plant experience to refine the parameters that, that we're using in the model. And we need to validate our sub-models that go into the overall model. And, and of course, we need to verify the predictions from the master blockage model. And it would be helpful to do that if we had some sort of standardized reporting uh, format for data from the field. Uh, this is just the publications that have come out of the EMPRI-sponsored modeling project over the last uh, three or four years. And these are, these are in your handouts. 